Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law. For today's case, we have a situation where qualified immunity just isn't good enough. It's time for qualified immunity's big brother. Yes, it's time. The legends have been told, but we've never really discussed it. It's not qualified immunity. It's time to talk about absolute immunity. An even harder standard that makes it harder to sue the government. That's today's case. Today is Renata Singleton versus the case of Leon Casanoro. Apologize for the names on that one. But in this case, the prosecutors were sending out fake subpoenas. The people are upset about the fake subpoenas and they want to sue the prosecutor. But the prosecutor has not qualified immunity, but absolute immunity. Or do they? That's what we're here to figure out. Whether or not you can sue a prosecutor for sending out fake subpoenas. Let's find out. The plaintiffs allege that for years, the prosecutor at Orleans Parish District Office in Louisiana, under the direction of the district attorney, Leon Casanero, used fake subpoenas to pressure crime victims and witnesses to meet with them. These documents were labeled subpoena and were marked with an office's official seal. They directed recipients to appear before the district's office for the parish of Louisiana, which is just the county, the county of Orleans, apologize, Orleans, and warned that a fine and imprisonment may be imposed for failure to obey this notice. The officers used these fake subpoenas that violated Louisiana law, which wish the prosecutors used to channel proposed subpoenas through a court. Okay, so as you might expect, there is a process to obtain subpoenas. You go to a court and obtain a subpoena. But the prosecutors are like, well, we don't have time for that. So we're just going to create fake subpoenas. Yes, we're going to create fake subpoenas. They're going to have our office logo on it and our seal. And they're going to have the word subpoena. And they're going to look a lot like a subpoena. But they're not a subpoena because they're not being authored by a court. They're fake. And we're going to do this. This is our plan to issue these fake subpoenas in order to pressure people to, mar to meet with us. What can possibly go wrong? Let's read more. So who did they pressure? Let's learn a little bit more about some of the people they pressured. Plaintiff Renata Singleton is a domestic violence victim who refused to speak with prosecutors about a domestic violence incident. She alleges the investigator from the office then delivered two fake subpoenas to her room. The fake subpoena demanded that she appear at the office for questioning. She didn't comply. Person number one, domestic violence victim. You're up on The Price is Right. Who's next? Plaintiff Lorenza Banham's daughter's boyfriend was murdered. The officers charged the suspect with committing the murder. Banham spoke at her home and over the telephone with two investigators from the office about the murder. One of the investigations allegedly persuaded Baum to provide testimony that contradicted her memory of events. In the following months, Banham received several fake subpoenas demanding she appear at private meetings in the office. She refused to comply. A defendant, a defendant who is an assistant district attorney, so an assistant district attorney, a prosecutor, then applied for a material witness warrant based on the refusal to meet with the warrant, the office. She's jailed over a week as a result. <laughs> she since testified twice in a pretrial proceedings in a case apparently pursuant to lawful subpoenas. Wow, that's that's just that's just that's just that's just super great work there. So the prosecutor sent out two fake subpoenas and because they failed to because they failed to respond, they got a material witness warrant and sent her to jail for failure to respond to their fake subpoenas. This is a thing that happened. Can can she can she sue for being sent to jail on a material witness warrant for not responding to subpoenas that didn't exist? Can she can she sue the prosecutor for deprivation of liberty on that? Let's press on. Plaintiffs Fano, Foya Bailey and Tiffany Lacroix were both potential witnesses in two different murder cases. They each received fraudulent subpoenas demanding a private meeting. Both Bailey and Lacroix retained a counsel who moved to quash the fake subpoenas. In response to the motion to quash, the plans, the prosecutors withdrew the subpoenas. That's really, that's really great work there. Okay, so they obtained a subpoena to appear, and they, they don't want to appear. So what do you do? You don't want to obey a subpoena. That's okay. We have an option for you. It's called a motion to quash. Why do we call it a motion to quash? I don't know. We just do. Motion to cancel, motion to abrogate, whatever. We call it a motion to quash. So you don't want to appear for this. So what you do is you hire a lawyer. And your lawyer filed paperwork with a court, said, hey, court that issued this subpoena. Hey, court that issued the subpoena. My client would really prefer not to comply with the subpoena. So we're going to fight it. 
And the prosecutors, of course, because there is no subpoena, because it doesn't exist, because the court never issued it, said, oh, we'll just cancel the subpoena. Never mind. Never mind. Yeah, we'll just we'll just cancel the subpoena. That doesn't really exist. That's good. Can can we can we sue for that? Can we sue for the attorneys for our legal fees for them fighting a court order that doesn't exist? Can we sue for that? Let's find out. Okay, let's press on. The plaintiffs sued the defendant, the prosecutors, in federal court, asserting various federal constitutional claims for money and injunctive release against the, assert, is the attorneys and against the lead district attorney. The defendants, the prosecutors, moved to dismiss. They contend that absolute immunity barred each plan of damages against the defendants. They assert five of these claims should also be dismissed on qualified immunity. When qualified immunity isn't good enough, let's go to its big brother, absolute immunity. We're absolutely immune. Forget, forget, forget everything. Forget everything you know about clear. Forget everything you know about QI law. Forget everything you know, because none of it matters. Was it a clearly established constitutional right? Is it something so obvious that we don't need a case to establish it? Doesn't matter. Clearly established, blatantly obvious. Doesn't matter. Good enough for QI, as hard as it is, but not good enough for absolute immunity. Not good enough for absolute immunity. Clearly established. What's that? We don't care. You can't sue us. Absolute immunity. For when qualified immunity just won't do. The district court granted the absolute or qualified immunity for the defendants on all but two of the claims relating to this. District court said, yeah, that sounds fine to us. Okay, what's the court of appeals have to say? This will be good. So now we have to learn about absolute immunity. Now we have to learn about this wonderful thing called absolute immunity, the thing that you didn't know existed. And we're going to learn a little bit about it because, yes, it's actually a thing that actually exists. They didn't just make it up. There's a thing called absolute immunity. Let's learn about absolute immunity. This will be good. This will, this, will, this will bring warmth to everyone on the channel, right? Okay, here we go. Absolute immunity. The individual defendants first claim that they're absolutely immune from the plaintiff's claim arising from these fake subpoenas, although they may yet prevail on this claim. We disagree with their arguments at this stage. So we're not saying you're wrong. You might be right, but we're going to let things proceed a little bit further to figure out whether it is. But you might have absolute immunity. We're not sure. So we're just going to disagree with you this far. Good. The Supreme Court extended absolute immunity for 1983 claims to state prosecutors in a case called Imbler v. Pachtemann. In that case, a state criminal defendant. So let's learn a little bit about where where absolute immunity came from. Let's learn a little bit about where this came from. And let's learn about the case that generated this. So what happened in this other case? I'm so glad you asked. In that case, a criminal defendant whose conviction had been overturned sued the prosecutor, several pro pro police officers, and fingerprint experts, alleging a conspiracy among them to unlawfully charge and convict them. But the court concluded that state prosecutors are absolutely immune from 1983 damages based on activities intimately associated with the judicial phase of criminal prosecution. Thus, this court held a state prosecutor who acts within the scope of his duties in initiating and pursuing a criminal prosecution is absolutely immune for violating constitutional rights. Yep, the Supreme, the Supreme Court of the United States says prosecutor, says the police, fingerprint expert, all these other people, eh, maybe. But the prosecutor, absolute immunity for violating our constitutional rights. Don't, don't, don't irritate the prosecutor, I guess, is the operative lesson of the day. In discussing the absolute immunity doctrine, the Supreme Court has made clear that the interest is in protecting the proper functioning of the office rather than the interest in protecting its occupant. That is of primary importance. Uh-huh, sure, that's... That definitely sounds like a thing that's happening. We're, we're not interested in protecting the person. We're interested in protecting the sanctity of the office by preventing the person from being sued in their personal capacity, one would presume. So, okay. So, yeah, that we, we, we are concerned about the sanctity of the prosecutor's office. That's, that's a bridge too far. Okay. 
Instead, the Supreme Court has taken a functional approach to absolute immunity that emphasizes that officials seeking absolute immunity bears the burden of showing that immunity is justified for the function in question. More specifically, the court distinguishes between actions taken in preparing for the initiation of judicial proceedings or for trial and those that occur in the role as an advocate for the state and administrative duties and those investigatory functions that do not relate to investigatory pre preparation for initiation of prosecution or judicial proceedings. So they, they've at least tried to somewhat curtail their own legal decision by restraining this absolute immunity to only those functions that occur as part of the judicial functions. So if the, the things that occur in preparations for the pr trial or the things occurring during trial are absolute immune, but not administrative and investigative functions. So they have, they have constrained the absolute immunity doctrine by only applying it to the things that occur in a trial practice setting. Okay. In the prior case of Buckley, the petitioner sued prosecutors for allegedly fabricating evidence during a preliminary stage of a crime and making false statements at a press conference announcing the return of the indictment. The Supreme Court held the prosecutors in that case were not absolutely immune for fabricating evidence because they lacked probable cause to arrest the petitioners or to initiate the proceedings at the time of the fabrication. Uh, presumably, if they had probable cause to initiate proceedings, they could have faked the evidence. But they couldn't fake the evidence because they didn't have probable cause. But if they had probable cause to initiate proceedings, maybe they could fake the evidence. We're not going to say. So maybe faking evidence is okay sometimes. Maybe maybe faking evidence is okay sometimes. Maybe it's okay to fake evidence if you already have enough evidence to have probable cause. Maybe you can fake more evidence. But if you don't have any evidence, you can't fake it. But if you have some evidence, maybe you can. That's what the Supreme Court says. What do you want from me? Okay. Thus, the prosecutor's mission at the time was entirely investigative in character because we couldn't begin judicial proceedings because we didn't have enough evidence. But if we had, who knows? Importantly, however, the court also recognized that determination of probable cause does not guarantee a prosecutor's absolute immunity from all actions to take elsewhere. Even after determination, a prosecutor may engage in police actions as entitled only to qualified immunity. So they left themselves open a door. So maybe after they do have, um, maybe after they do have enough, they still won't be able to fake evidence, but that's another problem for another day. Encouraging. Two dollars from Phoenix. Phoenix. Thank you. Is it Phoenix? Like Phoenix or Phoenix? Phoenix. Or is it Phoenix? Phoenix. I'm going with Phoenix. Two dollars from Phoenix. I love them to turn to find the sanctity of office. Don't ask questions like that, Phoenix. If you don't ask questions like that, you will not be sad, or you'll be less sad. Ignorance is bliss. Is basically what I'm trying to argue for at this point. We have adhered to the functional approach to absolute immunity. We have held that conduct protected by absolute immunity is not limited only to the act of initiating proceedings and the conduct occurring during the courtroom, but instead to all actions, all actions which occur in the course of the role as advocate of the state. Good. Thus, prosecutors are absolutely immune even for... Okay, this. I want you to make sure that you're paying attention to this part, because if you weren't sad yet, I want you to pay attention so that you can become properly sad. Are you ready to become properly sad? Let's become properly sad. Thus, prosecutors are absolutely immune even for willful or malicious prosecutorial misconduct if it occurs in the exercise of the advocacy function. Yep. Willful, malicious prosecution. Absolute immunity. No problem. Yep, you can do that. There you go. All right. But by the same token, if the state prosecutors are not entitled to absolute immunity, where they perform functions other than their quasi-judicial functions of initiating proceedings and presenting the state's case, I'm sure that makes all the people subject to willful malicious prosecution feel so much better. with all that description of what absolute immunity is. Perhaps you'd like to know why absolute immunity exists. Why is this a thing? Why is this a thing that exists? Good question. Let's read why it's a thing that exists. The policy underlying absolute prosecutorial immunity is twofold. First, the special nature 
of responsibilities of those engaged in judicial process requires such persons be accorded absolute immunity when they participate in that process. This is relevant because the prosecutor's, prosecutor's immunity is derived from the absolute immunity accorded judges and grand jurors. So in case you're wanted, you wanted to know, this wasn't just a prosecutor thing. Also, judges and grand jurors also have absolute immunity to screw you over. You can't sue judges and you can't sue grand jurors either. They are also immune and can also willfully and maliciously destroy your life as long as they're doing it as part of the judicial role. Yep. Good times. This is an immunity necessitated by concern that these actors in judicial process required by law to make important decisions regarding initiation, conduct, and merit of controversies, which often excite the deepest feelings of the parties, would be intimidated in the exercise of their discretion by fear of retaliatory lawsuits brought against by angry defendants. A prosecutor's fear of liability could, in a variety of ways, seriously undermine the criminal justice system's goal of accurately determining guilt or innocent of defendants. I, d I don't know what to tell you other than that's what the court says. Apparently, the police don't require this absolute immunity, so they, they are not being intimidated by merely qualified immunity, as we have seen in too many cases. So the police are not being intimidated by qualified immunity, but prosecutors and judges and grand jurors, they're more, um, they're, they're less, uh, a lot with less constitution, less resolve. They, they are not, they're not as strong as the police. So they would be intimidated. So we need to give them something more. Qualified immunity isn't good enough. Let's, let's kick that, let's kick that up a notch. Emerald style. Let's kick that up a notch and give them absolute immunity because we need to make sure that they will not be intimidated into maliciously and willfully prosecuting people. Yeah, that's what the law is. Let's press on. But when a prosecutor acts outside this quasi-judicial role, he is not making decisions comparable to that of a juror, judge or a grand juror. All right. Thus subjecting him to liability for such decisions will not interfere to the same degree with the fu functioning of the criminal justice system. If you say so. For this reason, when a prosecutor makes an investigative decision comparable to that of a police officer, such as whether to order a search and seizure, the prosecutor is not entitled to absolute immunity. Instead, he's given the same immunity that a police officer would have qualified immunity. So if you somehow strayed outside the bounds, it's okay. You still get qualified immunity. So we, we, need, we need a clearly established case that says you can't issue fake subpoenas, assuming that we're not within the judicial role because we still haven't gone that far. We still haven't made that predicate assumption of you're not within the judicial role. We'd like to hear more about whether you're in the, were you or were you not within the judicial role when you faked judicial subpoenas? This is the kind of question this court is asking right now. Okay. The plaintiffs allege that individual defendants use the fraudulent subpoenas to pressure crime victims and witnesses to meet with them outside of court. Both the Ninth Circuit and our court have issued decisions involving somewhat analogous facts we discuss. In Lacey, the Ninth Circuit held a prosecutor who had issued a fake subpoena was not entitled to absolute immunity. The prosecutor had created purported subpoenas and issued them to a news organization without grand jury or court approval required by law. The plaintiffs allege the prosecutor's avoidance of the judicial subpoena process was intentional. Okay. In delaying the, in deciding, in denying the absolute immunity, the Ninth Circuit stated prosecutors generally enjoy absolute immunity for conduct before grand juries because the conduct is integral to judicial function of the criminal process. But we can find no justification for extending absolute immunity to the acts of prosecutor desired to avoid judicial phase. So at least according to the Ninth Circuit, if you were doing it deliberately, then you might be outside the absolute immunity because you weren't in your judicial function. But if you did it only accidentally, then whatever. That's what the Ninth Circuit says. Okay. Similarly, in our case of Loop, we have held that although a prosecutor enjoyed absolute immunity for a decision to prosecute a plaintiff, they are not entitled to absolute immunity for ordering a warrantless arrest. We note that in ordering a warrantless arrest, a prosecutor acts directly to deprive someone of liberty, as opposed to what they do in a courtroom, I guess, 
They step outside the role as an advocate of the state before a neutral and detached governmental body and take upon themselves the responsibility of determining whether a probable cause exists, much as police routinely do. Nothing in this procuring of immediately warrantless arrest is so essential to the judicial process a prosecutor must be entitled to absolute immunity. So, ordering someone's arrest without a warrant apparently is outside the judicial function. I don't know what would happen if you faked the warrant. That would be an interesting question, I guess. That prosecutor decided not to try to fake the warrant. They just did it without a warrant. Okay. Prosecutors argued creating and issuing fake subpoenas was protected prosecutorial conduct. I may, just make sure that you're paying attention here. The government, okay. The, gov the government, the prosecutors. The prosecutors are arguing that creating and issuing fake subpoenas was protected prosecutorial conduct because it relates to a core prosecutorial function of preparing evidence and testimony for trial. Wow. Yeah, issuing those fake subpoenas was totally within our role because it goes straight to the issue of preparing evidence and testimony for trial. So issuing fake subpoenas, totally fine. But the Supreme Court has, re has squarely rejected this broad interpretation of absolute immunity. Thank God. Almost any action by a prosecutor, including his or her direct participation in a purely investigative activity, could be said in some way to be related to an ultimate decision of whether to prosecute. But we've never indicated that absolute immunity is that expensive. So it does have some limits somewhere. Where we are, who knows. Based on the pleadings before us at this time, it could be concluded, but not necessarily is, the defendant's creation and use of the fake subpoenas was not intimately associated with the judicial phase of the process, but rather fell into the phase of investigative functions that do not relate to an advocate's preparation for proceedings. We're not sure which of those two it is, but someone will get back to us on that, I guess. The defendants assert their use of fake subpoenas is like that in Imbler, a prosecutor's out-of-court effort to control the presentation of witness testimony, which the Supreme Court has held within the function as an advocate. But they overlooked the context of the statement. In Embler, the petitioner held the prosecutor had engaged in investigative, not prosecutorial activity, when he requested during a recess the police hold off questioning a witness about a pending background charge until after the witness had obtained the testimony. Here, in contrast, the defense were not obtained to control witness testimony during a break in proceedings. Instead, they allegedly used the fake subpoenas an attempt to pressure crime victims witnesses and witnesses to meet with them privately to share information outside court. Defendant never used fake subpoenas to compel witness or victims to testify at trial. That'd be hilarious. Uh, fake subpoenas to, to be a forced witness. That'd be good. Such uh, Apparently, though, the court thinks that that might be okay. So I just want you to make note here. The court is apparently saying that that would be okay. So apparently, if the fake subpoena is to appear at a trial that's ongoing... That would be okay. So fake subpoenas at trial, those are cool because those are happening during the judicial proceeding. Such allegations of investigative behavior were not intimately associated with the proceedings at this part of the process. Okay. By using the fake subpoenas, the individual defendants also allegedly intended to avoid the judicial process that law requires for obtaining subpoenas. Presumably, yes. The creation and use of the subpoenas thus fell outside the judicial process. That would seem logical, but at this point, who knows? So that is the decision of the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in the case of Renata Singleton and others versus the District Attorney of Orleans Parish in Louisiana. In this case, we learn that the District Attorney and his subordinates issued fake subpoenas to crime victims and in one case got a material witness order on the basis of them failing to respond to the fake subpoena. And they claimed absolute immunity when they got, got caught and sued. And the Court of Appeals says, well, we're not quite sure uh, on, at this point, but you can go back to trial and argue it on QI. So you still have qualified immunity. You still can argue the qualified immunity. And if the government is found not to be liable, then we don't have to figure out those issues. If they are found to be liable, then I guess we'll have to figure out whether it's absolute immunity or not. But they sent it back to trial for some further proceedings, so we'll have to figure out whether the district attorney of Orleans Parish in Louisiana will have to merely make do with the qualified immunity the police do, or whether they have absolute immunity. But that's the end of the coverage for now. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family.
I appreciate your continued support. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel and you can also support us financially by clicking the applaud button below. Thank you so much for your contributions to our channel. It helps our work grow. Until later, cheers and goodbye.